Really terrific way to open uh, the, the panels. Our next panel explores the role of art in education. What are the most effective ways to teach 21st century skills? And how is the American education system incorporating these strategies? Please welcome the president of the Annenberg Foundation Trust, Jeffrey Cowan, and his panelists. Thank you so much, and thanks. I must say, being here, Alice and Don, and what your team has done, this has just been extraordinary. It's really, it's so exciting. Uh, and by the way, for those who haven't noticed, we've got an artwork going on in the back of the room there, which is keeping track of the conversation. Everyone in the room is deeply familiar with the issues of art and education. Uh, and uh, its vital role in American society, as well as some of the challenges that it faces. Uh, but more than 30 years ago, the Annenberg Foundation actually gave $150 million to PBS, which was largely designed to create the opportunity for people around the world to have art brought into their homes through television. That was a different time. It was a different concept of art. And the demography and the technology in the country was, and the world were different. And so it's, it, from our standpoint, from the Annenberg Foundation's perspective, it's really very exciting to see this kind of a conversation going on. In keeping with the theme of today, which are insights from a changing America, this panel actually offers insights from three very different and important points of view about art and education. Uh, and then we'll hopefully have time for a few questions at the end of their presentations. First of all, Hope Ginsberg is a visual artist who's now based at Virginia Commonwealth University. She's an art educator, particularly for uh, college students, who uses project-based art in innovative ways that may be relevant to the ways that we think about art education. Tom Finkelpearl now is the uh, commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, a hugely powerful and exciting position where he gives away, put your hands up if you're looking for money, over $300 million a year, something we all wish we had our own communities as kind of support for the arts. But before he took on that job a few months ago, he gained international acclaim for his work uh, as the president of the Queen's Museum, which among its many, many achievements was very innovative in the way in which it brought arts education to very diverse populations. And I think that'll be a fascinating discussion uh, from, from Tom. And then finally, John Brown, well known in this community, he was a state senator who actually, from Arkansas, actually represented this community when it was a smaller community. Mm -hmm. and, and its growth, I'm sure, is uh, due to his work as a state senator uh, and a little bit to uh, Walmart. <laughs> uh, he also was the president of John Brown University, uh, but he now has a very exciting role as the executive director of the Wingate Charitable Foundation, which has been a wonderful philanthropist in the fields of art education, both at the school level and also in the museums. So uh, please join me in welcoming these three, three terrific panelists, and we'll start with the conversation, uh, co comments from Hope. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, it's such an honor to be here, and I believe I'll have some slides that will just kind of scroll behind me as I speak. And in front of you, too. Oh, very good. Sea sponges, a very humble animal that until the late 18th century were mistaken for plants, have been muses of mine for the past several years. Coded into their very cellular structure is a model for collectivity and collaboration, as because these single cell organisms first joined to make a multicellular organism, we have an animal that renders the social. Through activities at the sponge headquarters, situated at the Anderson Gallery of the Virginia Commonwealth School of the Arts in Richmond, Virginia, I have conducted project-based post-disciplinary work with students collaboratively to generate art projects, events, installations that involve a curiosity about the natural world. <clears throat> The Sponge HQ has an indoor functioning beehive, a fish tank, a studio for the natural dyeing of wool and felt making. It produces projects that are curricular and extracurricular, and it's monitored by student participants <coughs> who join me in making artwork, who take the classes, and who open the space to the public during the week. So I'd like to share with you a couple examples of projects that the students and I have made together 
through this very social artwork, a school within a school at VCU. The first of which is a class called Collab Lab Lab, in which I enrolled as an undergraduate student at Virginia Commonwealth University, signed up for an undergraduate biology lecture and lab class, and then all of the students who were in my class had a collaborative lab about the lab. Our class together took a class. And from that research-based experience, we made um, artworks which we showed first um, at an exhibition in the Sponge headquarters, which is a classroom, workshop space, project space, also in Long Island City, in New York City, at Flux Factory as part of a project called Science Fair. We had a booth. Um, the students and I showed artifacts. Actually, in that, uh, in that science fair show, we won a trophy for being most empirically rebellious, which I was just <laughs> delighted by uh, in terms of an art and science hybrid. Anyway, um, we, uh, we showed this work, artifacts of this work, at the QArt Foundation in New York City and presented for the first time a book called The Collab Lab Lab Book, which the students jointly produced. Another project I want to bring up today, which I feel really resonates with the mission at Crystal Bridges, is a biennial in the south of uh, Brazil called the Mercosul Biennial, uh, which has a very strong pedagogical mission, much like the distance learning and outreach that's going on at Crystal Bridges, and which buses students, school children from all over the state of Rio Grande do Sul to see this exhibit. Students from the Sponge headquarters and I along with young artists and designers who are mediators of this biennial, who are in the role of translating this art experience to the public, rendered four species of Brazilian sea sponge, well, I'm sorry, two were, fre two were freshwater sponges, one of which was uh, named by a marine biologist with whom we were in dialogue, who named this genus as a sophomore in undergraduate school and worked with us as a consultant on the project. So we rendered four species of Brazilian sponge, in wool, and it was cooperatively produced in, you're seeing some images of the dye lab with plant and insect pigments in Richmond, and also on the ground in Porto Alegre. So to conclude this overview of, this, of, the, of the world of the sponge, sponge headquarters and collab lab lab, I, I wanna offer just a, a story of students working in a truly interdisciplinary way truly collaboratively, and both as independent agents in these projects, but also as participants who need to identify their role to join in a productive collaboration. They are learning the skills of, of research, they are learning skills of representation, but they're also learning uh, tools that are so fundamental to the arts themselves of humor, of irony, of metaphor, which we need to preserve in our disciplines. So at the Sponge headquarters, which is based on this model of being an organism that absorbs, that filters, and then generates food for the animals that live with it, I would assert that these students and I are working in the spirit of the sponge. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hope. And I, I think we all get the sense that this collaborative work you do together is also fun, fun, fun. <laughs> my job, by the way, is timekeeper, uh, Tom um, yes. Pro. And I know my slides need to be. You made it great. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, how art education unfolds in museums and then also in the public school system in New York City. By the way, when you mentioned 300 million as the number of, that we give away, we have about $150 million of operating support and another $150 million of capital money for arts organizations in New York City. And, and you told me that if that were, if on a per capita basis, there was that much money at the federal level. How much yeah, be, uh, the NEA would have five or six billion dollar budget. We have a much, we have a bigger budget in real terms, but per capita, uh, I think the, the NEA should have a five billion dollar budget. Um, okay, so one of the things that's happening in museums around America today is a basic move from the collections-based museum to the experience-based museum. You hear about this all the time at museum conferences, uh, and in that context, education takes on a much more important role. As long as museums are all about preserving and exhibiting, exhibition, uh, exhibiting objects, the education department was sort of secondary, 
but it really is, is changing a lot. So the, uh, I want to pick up a little bit on what Darren Walker said before about diversity. 94% of curators in America are white, I have heard from Marriott Westerman at, uh, at Mellon. That's not true in education departments. Education departments, often the senior member of a staff at a museum who's, who's African American, who's a person of color, will be the education director. And I was speaking to some colleagues last night, and I, I believe that there is no American museum who has an African American chief curator and a white director of education. The opposite is true at many museums. So this has actually been a point of diversity that already exists in museums, where we don't have to wring our hands and say, if only we could get some people of color to run education departments. And one of the things that I think that's done is, is you know, change the nature of the vision of what the audience is. So that one of the, the um, uh, things that you know, people say about curators are kind of gatekeepers, right? Curators are the people that say who can't come into the door of a museum. By the way, my wife is a wonderful curator. She's in the audience today. I love curators. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the education department at museums are often the people that want to open the door. So I was at the Brooklyn Museum where my wife works the other night. There were five or 6,000 people streaming through the museum. It was an extremely diverse audience. It's called First Saturdays. The only problem with First Saturdays is it had gotten to the point where 25,000 people were coming on particular nights. The police department said, you're going to have to tamp it down. This partially is because the education department is sort of running the museum that night. So there's food, there's drink, there's activities, there's you know, lectures, there's things for the family. There was a dance party that they had to cancel um, because there were too many people coming. I don't know if anybody read the article about uh, the Brooklyn Museum director, Arnold Lehman, is stepping down. During his time at the museum, the percentage of, uh, of minority visitorship went from 20% to 40% of their audience. And I think part of that had to do with that, that recognition of diversity and staff diversity. Um, Darren alluded earlier to, to some efforts that are being made, but I think we all have to look into the mirror and say, we can't put up with this idea of staffs that aren't divorced diverse anymore that 94% of curators in America being white is unacceptable. That's not the future of America. So let me just say a little bit about what we did at the Queens Museum. Uh, when I got to the Queens Museum, we had a big education department already. Uh, Queens is the most diverse place in America, supposedly. You might want to argue with me. One of the most diverse at minimum. 138 languages are spoken there, so it's obvious who the audience is going to be. It's going to be 60% of households are run by immigrants, so it's going to be heavily immigrants. So we we had a, a vibrant education department. We said, what can we do better to get more people to come? So we actually broke the public events department off from education, but within that sort of um, umbrella, we came to a certain point and said, you know who gets, who really understands how to get communities activated? Community organizers. Why don't we hire community organizers, not outreach specialists, community organizers on our staff who can go into the community, understand, listening actively to what's going on in the community, and ask people what they want in the museum, not saying, we have something of value that you should like. That's a very different approach. So we have two art therapists on the staff. It's not enough to invite special needs groups into a museum. You should have a specialist who has a degree in the subject who understands the difference between an educational opportunity for an autistic child and a child with Down syndrome. Uh, so we had um, the community uh, organizers, the um, art therapists, and we had, then we started a collaboration with the library system in Queens, which actually understands diversity and already has a diverse audience. It's one of the most successful library systems in America with 15 million visitors a year in 62 locations. So we started a, an adult program, which was arts programming in native tongue. If you have 138 languages spoken. You should be teaching in those languages. I believe people should learn English. We had English as a second language classes at the museum. We had English as a second language through cooking with artists who deal with food, through feminist art history. Learning goes through feminist art history. I love that class. Um, anyway, so that the idea of understanding your community, reaching out, embracing a community, something education departments already do quite well. How many minutes? One more minute? Oh, okay. Minute so quite quickly, 
uh, I'm a member of the de Blasio administration. When we got into office, the number one priority in the arts was let's get art back into the public school system of New York City. There are two parts of that, which was sort of, you know, take the gas off a little bit on the high stakes testing. And we added $24 million to the budget for arts education this year, permanent $24 million to get our teachers back in there. Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I have, can take no credit to that, I'm sorry to say. But um, the idea also being, one of the things, and I'll, I'll end with this, two people, on one of the videos, one of the folks was quoted as saying, words just don't add up to what he was doing. And then uh, Matthew, Matthew Moore said, it's a state words don't describe. So the focus of the arts education that we're doing in New York City actually has to do doing and making and enabling you know, crazy people like Pope Ginsburg to, to have a voice in the school system. Um, that thing that can't be described in words is a different approach to the critical thinking approach to, to art, which has really, which by the way, can be awesome at a museum as well. Critical thinking is something you do when you look at a work of art. Something else is happening that's almost indescribable when you're actually making art, participating in theater, participating in dance, and that's what we're focusing that $24 million on. And, and uh, John Brown, you're actually here, we are talking about New York, but you're looking at this state and, and other states uh, in the South and elsewhere, but in, in also extremely creative ways. Uh, hopefully so, yes. Uh, I had the privilege of representing the Wingate Charitable Foundation. We were formed back in 1993, so I guess I represent a funder's uh, uh, perspective here on arts and education in the 21st century. Uh, I'll warn you, given my background uh, as a college president, lawyer, and politician, brevity is not one of my known <laughs> virtues, but I'll do my best. Um, here in Northwest Arkansas, we had a um, uh, uh, strategic planning effort done by uh, the Northwest Council, and Doug McMillan and Jim Walton and others helped lead that a group, and uh, Mark Simmons here, Simmons Industry, was head of uh, the steering committee that came up with our strategic plan. We had four essential areas, economic development, I infrastructure, quality of life, and then education, and I had the privilege of chairing that uh, educational excellence work group for about three years. Dr. Reed Greenwood here was uh, chair of my higher education team. We had a K-12 team. Um, and a workforce development team. And also, it kind of parallels the discussions I heard in the state legislature, served on the education committee there for a while. These kinds of groups, when I'm in an education uh, and arts setting, we begin with kind of a defensive or recriminate, recriminations, why aren't the arts more valued? Uh, why are they always on the chopping block uh, when there are cutbacks in public education and so forth? Why does the NEA, the State Arts Council, have to fight just to maintain their budget, much, much less to increase it. Uh, it's interesting, when you look at education in particular, what are the first questions that are, uh, we have to address in that uh, uh, strategic uh, plan for Northwest Arkansas? It's how do we keep kids in school? How do we keep them motivated to learn? How do we keep them on grade level? We know the importance of fourth, fourth grade reading level uh, achievement and so forth for future success. So the campaign for grade level reading, uh, the, the uh, Common Core and other uh, uh, projects that, that we work on. Uh, how, do, how do we uh, prevent dropouts, increase high school graduation rates, increase college matriculation rates? So we tend to lose the argument when we argue for arts for art's sake. But yet when you look at those questions, what motivates, what inspires kids, what makes for an exciting classroom. Uh, what helps them want to achieve? What makes them believe they can achieve? Uh, arts, to me, seem to be the answer, not the question. And uh, we've funded in a, in a lot of areas all across the country, Virginia Commonwealth, Museum of Modern Art, and you know, we have a lot of programs in which we take an interest, uh, particularly in American craft, help publish uh, a college textbook on the history of American craft, raising uh, that field, uh, we think, in terms of stature and interest, and, uh, curatorial interest and so forth. Uh, we've funded here, uh, 
enjoy being a partner with Crystal Bridges in an exploration of distance learning. How do you take this uh, magnificent uh, uh, experience that school kids have every day between 8 and 11 in the morning? Uh, Crystal Bridges is a reserve for these kids to come in and experience art in this fantastic uh, firsthand way. What about kids in low income and rural schools who can't just put their kids on a bus and come to Crystal Bridges? Can we replicate that experience, if not in full, at least in substantial part? So your wonderful team here, Alice, is pursuing that question. And hopefully we're, we'll have some exciting answers for a 21st century kind of education where, the, where those kinds of things are possible. Uh, one program that we discovered uh, funding as we do a, a number of uh, uh, kind of indigenous craft programs in Western North Carolina was a program called A Plus Schools. And I think if you'll start the scroll here, I very cleverly brought along this uh, visual evidence of A Plus Schools with smiling children doing hands-on activities <laughs> in the classroom. So at this point, you can tune me out and start watching mm -hmm. uh, uh, an A Plus School in action. But uh, through the Keenan Institute for the Arts, uh, former uh, iteration of uh, Keenan uh, funding. This program was started 20 years ago, and six or seven years into that program, we began receiving requests from schools in North Carolina to help with their A plus schools initiative. So we met with people from the Keenan Institute there uh, in Asheville and uh, became excited, interested in their model and actually had then a meeting in Little Rock to which we invited uh, some representatives from Oklahoma who were also interested in the model. And along in about 2002, 2003, both states began developing this program, which is uh, an intensive integration and fusion of the arts into the pedagogy, into the teaching methodology of public schools to teach math and science and literacy. And, uh, uh, it's, it's a whole school reform. Uh, the summer professional development program brings all the teachers from an individual school plus their leadership, the principal. Uh, the school takes on a character, a climate that values the arts, the importance of the arts. Uh, they uh, have uh, not only curriculum, uh, interdisciplinary studies uh, across the board, but uh, collaborative planning is one of the real strengths of this program. Good educational methodologies that ought to characterize all schools but that are intentionally a part of an a plus curriculum using multiple intelligences both in designing instruction but also in designing evaluation and assessments and uh, you know we can't necessarily fear uh, you know reading comprehension comprehension tests and so forth kind of the objective quantitative kind of testing that state legislators often demand to prove that our you know, billions of dollars in public education are accomplishing some purpose, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we're creating citizens and workers and believing, you know, uh, 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 spirits for the 21st century. And John, I think you told me that you're still looking to expand this program. Absolutely, so. yes. We have inquiries of program in Atlanta, Georgia, that a teacher from North Carolina started. We had last week two me meetings in Kansas with leaders there, funders, as well as school leaders who would like to adopt the model in Kansas and, and receive initial training from Oklahoma. We're also funding in Louisiana. The George Rodrigue Foundation down there has taken leadership of the Louisiana program. They're a natural. They're kind of so like when North we have Carolina. a break in a couple of minutes, for those of you who are educated, <laughs> this is Amanda Now, I think we have time for about two questions. We do have roving mics if people want to ask questions of panelists besides how do I apply for, for grant. Uh, <laughs> There'll be a line in the back when the session's <laughs> over. Uh, let, let me ask a question then about, about Crystal Bridges uh, uh, because you all know something about it, but John, maybe you could start with it. This is a museum and part of what I, th I think one time people thought of arts education and, and it's what you do so well, Tom, or did in your last job, people think of education as being school-based, and so much of what it's become is, is museum-based. And maybe any one of you actually could take that, uh, that on. But that, that, that seems to be a growing movement and a really a terribly important one. 
Well, I mean, I can just say that the most successful programs we ran were both. Um, so we did adult education, we did education, we did drop-in workshops, we did, you know, stuff that started in libraries and ended up at the museum. We had off-site, you know, uh, program in Corona, Queens, which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City, a multi-year relational project, not unlike the kind of work that Hope does. Uh, <clears throat> but the best school projects were one where an artist was in residence at the school for a year or two or three or four as a part-time teacher uh, with the art teacher in the school. There had to be an art teacher in the school already. And then comes for the experience at the museum. So that thing that sort of integrated in back into a different environment. So the schools, museums, and then you talked about the libraries before, which is another yes. part of it. Yeah, I mean, we happen to have an incredible library system in Queens that was a cultural hub. You know, there's this idea that America's libraries are dying just was not the case in Queens. There is a line in front of almost every library in Queens when they open every day. It's a place where people go to learn, and it was a place where we wanted to find the most successful cultural institutions we could possibly imagine to collaborate with, and in Queens, that was the library system. Let me see if there's a question out there. Otherwise, I'm going to ask if you, each of you just give a go-away thought, a, a concluding thought, about arts education and, and where it's going and what the people here could leave uh, today with as an as a inspiration. Cope? Um, I guess I'd like to put forward this idea of project spaces and project-based art making as lending itself quite naturally to pedagogy because of its inherent collaborative and interdisciplinary attributes. And I, so yeah, I mean, what hope, I don't know how people, who in this room is familiar with the term social practice art? So okay, let me just say what it is. She is a social practice artist. Social practice means that the art is made in community, collaboratively, interactively, with participation, this is something I spent my adult life studying for the most part. Yes, we have our found, first found books in the library. Yes, yes, here. our yeah. first uh, <laughs> great social artist just won a MacArthur two weeks ago, Rick Lowe. So it's something that's sort of bubbling up, and it's this, and, and education is almost always at the center of it. So that sponge project is a creative teaching mechanism art project. Rick Lowe's Project Grow Houses is, is an interactive, participatory, multi-year art project that is a community in Houston, Texas. You guys have to visit it. So I think it, that with the rise of social practice, and I know there's social practice artists in your show, um, this is a great moment for museum education because the artists are doing stuff that kind of looks like education. John? Uh, I think I'd quote uh, Scott Shire, who's head of school at the KIPP Delta Academy over at Helena, Arkansas. Uh, spectacular results with the students over there in a historically low-income uh, poverty area. Uh, recognized by the governor of our state, most legislators say, whoa, what are they doing at the KIPP Academy to achieve the kind of test scores that those students are, are achieving? Uh, Scott brought A-plus schools model to the KIPP Delta Academy and he felt there was something missing with all the extended day, the special programs, incentives, and, and, and achievements they were uh, uh, producing. And his comment was that the, adding the arts, intensive arts, uh, to the Kip Delta Academy for his kids helped turn on the light in their soul. Mm. And that's the impact of the arts. So we're gonna take a deep, uh, a brief uh, break uh, in the South lobby and then reconvene at 11 o'clock with Maya Lin. Please join me in thanking this terrific panel and enjoy the break. Yeah.